And when that peace comes into your life, don't let go of the word. Hang on to it. It is a blanket to your heart and your life. a series on the names of God, how important names are to God, and, and exactly what they do in our midst. We talked about first wonderful in Isaiah 9, 6. It talks about the five names that Jesus would have when he was born on earth. And how many of you know, just say wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and now we've been talking about the Prince of Peace, the one that has the power to bring peace into our life. As I was praying about this message last night, I want to lay this foundation this morning because it's so important that you understand what's going on here with peace. Uh, it was almost like the Holy Spirit just kind of spoke to me last night, and this is what he said. There isn't peace in this world because people do not have a commission or vision of me. And it takes that power. If you don't know what you believe in, you walk in confusion. And a lot of people don't recognize they believe in God, but there's some other things you need to believe in as well. Because it enforces what it does. And my topic today is... How do we walk in peace? How do we put that where the rubber meets the road? How do we bring that into our life? It's one thing to say it. It's one to say to, to know that we have the peace of God that passes all understanding, logic, or sense, or our ability, or our talent, way beyond that, or even that it guards our heart and our mind. It's one thing to say that, but how do we live that out? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. In order to live that out, you've got to know that you believe in things. And if you don't recognize that, then I want to tell you right now, what begins to happen in your life, in my life, is we don't set a foundation for God to operate or to motorize what he wants to do through peace in our life. And so the first thing I want to tell you this, if you're going to walk in peace, the first thing you've got to understand is number one, you got to love God's word and let it stand for what it means. Because God's word is under attack today, and it was like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, people can't have peace because they don't believe in the word of God. They come to church, they might even have a Bible laying on their book stand or their night post, but how many of you know it's time to get back to the good old foundation if you will, Christianity 101, that the Word of God is truth and everything else lines up to it. Because if you don't know that in your heart, the enemy, when you go to your work or your establishment or even in your home, what will happen is he will bring confusion into your life where there is no peace because we don't know the Word and what it stands for and we're willing to take whatever comes. And a lot of people, I, I love you, but it's so true, many people believe in the word, but they don't know what it says about them. And if you don't know what the word says about you and who you are in Christ and how he can overcome in your life and bring peace, what happens is you might walk with God, you might be saved, you might be on your way to heaven, but you won't ever be able to walk in the full peace of God because you're not standing for what is right. It's kind of like I want to tell you right now. How many of you know every book that is written is not from God? I said every book that is written is not from God. I had a man say to me this last week, it was kind of confusing to me. I wasn't quite sure what the point was, but this is what he said. He said, I've always been a Christian in my heart, but it's been hard. He said, my family was Jehovah's Witness. And so I thought, okay, well, I understand what you're saying, and I'm not, yes, I am. If they don't believe in the entire word of God, we need to run from it and quit playing games. All things, all religions don't lead to God. 
The Bible is truth and everything else is, has to line up to it. And we need to love those people, but we don't need to live like they do. We need to know and stand for what the Word of God says and what we believe in the Word of God. Amen? And then he said, I've been a really Christian and I really love, but I've gone to the Mormon church. Well, how many of you know? You can say what you want. I know this is going out. But I will tell you right now, the Book of Mormon does not take preeminence over this book. And Mormons will tell you they believe in the Bible as long as the places that doesn't agree with the Book of Mormon. Then they believe the Book of Mormon over the Bible. That's not believing in the Bible. And let me tell you one little thing here. The amazing part, and I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but it's really the truth. The Book of Mormon and Mormons are good people. And only the Lord is going to be able to sort it out at the end. But I know one thing. They believe in their book more than they believe in the Bible, irregardless of what they tell you at your front door. I've sat down with Mormons numbers of times, and they say, oh, no, we believe the Bible. And I said, well, what do you do? Because I don't know if you know this, but it's true. You can ask any Mormon. They believe that they are going to be some God someday, and they're going to go plant other uh, planets. They're going to populate other planets. They believe that in their Bible, when they marry, they marry for life. And that that wife, that's why Brigham Young, really, if you want to know the history of that, that's why Brigham Young actually allowed um, what we would call, what's a, polygamy. Because there was more women than men, and men were going to call their wives to heaven, not God. And so he had to make a way. How could they believe in that? If they couldn't be called forth by their husband because they didn't have one. People don't really realize what the Mormons really believe. And I'm not putting them down. I'm just telling you their belief. They can talk about my belief if they want in their church. But that's how they believe. They also believe that, that Jesus came to America and the Book of Mormon came from him. Well, that's not what my Bible tells me. My Bible said he went to the right hand of God and making an intercession for me. So no matter how good they are and how matter how much good they do, how many of you know, there isn't a lot of peace in their life. I really believe this because they don't stand for the truth. If you are going to stand for the truth, you better know how you believe and you better believe in the word of God and the word of God is taught to take first place in your life. Amen. Can I get an amen? This is a Bible-believing church, a faith-believing church, and we need to know where we believe and why we believe what we do because you can't find peace outside of the Word of God. Just take my testimony. I tried it for 27 years. And how many of you know it's been a lot better the last 30 years? Come on, church. And so I know the difference between being with God and the Word and knowing what I believe. And if you don't know how you believe, I want to guarantee you there's real confusion there. And where there's confusion, the enemy has a right to traffic in that. And that's why there's so much confusion and depression and different things because people don't... How many of you know there's a, there is literally a battle over this Word today where people want to say it isn't true, even to go to church every Sunday. Well, I want to tell you, it is the truth. It settles everything in life, and we need to stand for what we believe in, and we'll know peace. You can't know peace outside the Word. And that's what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me last night, that a lot of people are born again, love God, but because they don't know the Word and don't stand for the Word, they won't have peace down here on earth. Because this is what the Word says in Psalms. Great peace has this, for those who love the law. Great peace has those for who those that love. In the Old Testament, this is the law. In the New Testament, it's a new covenant. But if we don't believe in this, how many of you know we're not going to fight? Come on, can I get an amen in this spirit-filled church? And look at it. And nothing causes them to stumble. Why does he want us to know the word? So we won't stumble. We won't get out in all this other stuff that's trying to bring peace. Pills won't bring you peace. Drugs won't bring you peace. Alcohol won't bring you peace. But the Word of God will bring peace into your life. And when that peace comes into your life, don't let go of the Word. Hang on to it. It is a blanket to your heart and your life. Number two, how many of you know when we walk in the righteousness of God, 
we walk in peace. This is what it says. Isaiah 32. The working of righteousness will bring peace. And the effects of righteousness will quiet and assure our soul and anoint us. How many of you know that, what is he saying? What is righteousness? Is it how you dress? How many of you know that too many people are looking for legalism out of righteousness, and the word literally means to be in right standing with God. That's all it means. Or in the New Testament where it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, it literally means what would God do in this situation? How many of you know that's real peace? When you know, even though it's a hard thing you got to do, even though it's a challenging thing in your life that you got to do, or you got to stand up for something, if God's righteousness is in it, you can have peace to go through it. I mean, I want to tell you right now, I don't lower my standards at all. I do not believe in same-sex marriage. I do not believe that a homosexual was born that way. I do not believe... If it's contrary to the Word of God, I better know what I believe. Now, it doesn't mean we don't love people. But a lot of times, peace is not taught because people will, will compromise and not stand and say, what would God do? How many of you know Jesus would love those people, but he would not tolerate that in their life. He wouldn't say, that's okay. What did he do when he healed a woman, when, he, when they brought her to be stoned? He said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, okay, go ahead and go back to your own lifestyle. And this is what's wrong. Nobody will preach this anymore. And this is why there isn't any peace in America. Can I get an amen? I believe this is why there isn't any peace in America because we compromise. And where there's compromise, there's darkness, there's confusion. And the enemy traffics in that across America and across the world. And what it brings into our life is people don't even know what they really believe anymore. And I love you, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. I'm reading the word. Doesn't it say that the righteous... So it's not how high you can pile your hair or how low you can wear your hemline or if you wear a suit and tie every day. How many of you know God wants to know what's in your heart? I said God wants to know what's in your heart. And that's what's imperative in our life. And I'm not excluding anybody. I'm just standing up for what is right. What would God do? God would speak to those things. God blessed people. God anointed. But if we want his peace, our mind has to be working in the righteousness or right standing with God and stand up for what we believe, and we'll have peace in that no matter what the persecution is. This is why many of the martyrs in the early days of Christianity could be fed to the lions. It wasn't that there was no pain. It wasn't that there was no blood. It wasn't that there was no horror. But they knew what they believed, and they could stand even unto death. And there's an old song that we used to sing, Though none go with me, I still will follow. Or I, I, you know, I have people say, well, I would die for Christ. Well, Christ doesn't want you to die for him. What he wants to know, will you live for him? Are you willing to make the hard choices sometimes to stand and go against the crowd and to say, I believe in righteousness over just a worldly system that says everything is right. And I love you, but I'm not, and I'm not saying we need to go and pick it. I'm not saying we need to go and abuse anybody. But if someone asks you, you better know how you believe. And if you know how you believe, you'll walk in peace. If you falter, I want to tell you, you are allowing darkness to reign there. And things, there is a consequence of that. Can I get an amen? amen? When we seek God's way first, everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. But seek ye second the kingdom of God. But seek ye what? First. Does first mean first? Does anybody not understand what first means? What is the first number of the letters? One. Jesus talked more about being one than almost anything in the Bible if you look at the New Testament. Look up the word one sometime just in the New Testament. How many times? Because he knew everything begins with one. It's a zero or a two before or after that. It's nothing or one or it's second. I've said before, but it's so true, and it said right then this prophecy, this lady was here last week, God is not your co-pilot. God better be the pilot. Because if he's the co-pilot, that means you're making the decisions of where you're going. 
how you're going to fly the plane, what you're going to do. How many of you know he better be making decisions and you better be, just look at your neighbor and say, you look like a co-pilot to me. Just tell him that. Hallelujah. Number three, how many of you know you need to walk by faith and not by sight? If you're going to have peace, you better not be going by sight. In fact, it's an amazing thing to me because so many people go by only what they see. I just took, uh, in first of December, last of November, right after Thanksgiving, we took two of our grandkids down to Disneyland. Has every, anybody ever been on California soaring or whatever it is? I think it is. Yeah. I mean, they really get you there, don't they? I mean, they not only visualize and freak you out. When you go over the orange fields, they spray this orange smell in the air. And how many of you know your greatest memory is your smell? In fact, I'll tell you, I've said this before, but it's true. When I used to work for a, uh, when I used to work for a living, um, <laughs> I don't consider this a work, it's a calling. And I have to be careful because I go to work, but it's not a job. How many of you know? Hallelujah. But I would go in the back room now and every now and then there'd be a truck in the pit and I would smell diesel and it would take me back immediately to Vietnam because I was on a gunboat for nine months and if you've ever been around water and the engines all ran on diesel and so it would hover around the water and no matter sometimes where you would go you'd wake up with that smell and you'd go to sleep with that smell and it's funny how your mind is but I would be standing back there knowing that I'm in a solid building, but it would take me back to that, that place. Your smell is the most powerful thing the enemy sometimes can even use against you. But because it works with your eyes. Your eyes are telling you you're in a safe place, you're smelling a truck, but your mind will try to take you back to the horror. Come on, church. Are you, I mean... I'm sorry to be so transparent, but that's the way life is. And you can't have peace without walking in faith. You can't go by what you see all the time. If you go only by what you see, your mind will run wild with you. You've got to have belief that God is greater than what you see. In fact, this is what the Word says in Matthew. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things will be added unto you. How many of you know we want the, like a lot of people right now, how many of you know, how many of you know anything about the lottery right now? Somebody, that's right, somebody told me as we're leaving that it's over a billion, one, I don't even know. <laughs> and how many of you know that that's amazing, but there's going to be a lot of disappointed Wednesday people if someone wins. Can I get an amen? Come on, church. Are you out? This is where we live. But how many of you know we don't live by that? We live by faith. And literally, if you don't live by faith and, and go by what you don't see, if only finances and only perfectness and only happiness can bring into your life that godliness, I want to tell you the enemy will make sure that doesn't happen. But when he realizes that doesn't work against you, come on, church, can I get an amen here? When the enemy works that that, and knows that doesn't work anymore, how many of you know he'll try another door or window? You always have to be aware, but you have to strengthen yourself in the Lord. You have to recognize, uh, like Romans says, and so when we walk by faith and not by sight, now may God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing. This is what Romans says. That you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know he didn't say by what was going on in your life? You can't live in faith if you're going to live by only what you feel and see. I have learned this a long time ago. That my life is temporal here and what I see all things are temporal, but my other life, my spirit born again life is eternal, and that's what matters to God. Not everything I see, not everything I feel, not every circumstance that comes my way. I know a lot of people say, well, you preach on that a lot. Well, that's because I'm trying to get it in your head to live by it. 
Because if you live only by the moment or the circumstance of what's going on, the enemy will play into that so often that he will keep us bound up from having the liberty we need to have hope in life. And the only way we're going to have that, it says, it's impossible to please God. How many of you want to please God? For all of you that raised your hand, praise the Lord. The rest of you liars, I know you all want to please. I believe you wouldn't be here if you didn't want to please God. But the word says it's impossible to please him, but there is a way to please him. It's impossible to please God without faith. In other words, when we work in faith, when we operate in faith, when we don't go by what we see, but the evidence of things not seen, the evidence of things hoped for, how many of you know that is pleasing to God? Irregardless of what's going on around us. Irregardless of the things that are happening. Amen? And then fifthly, how many of you know we have to walk? I keep going the wrong way on this today. It must be the enemy's trying to rob me. When we walk in humility and meekness. This is, uh, let, let me go back to the lottery. Well, let me read this first. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in abundant peace. Not just peace, but abundant peace. Now the word abundant, if you don't recognize that, means more than enough. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Now, we're, you know, many people, in fact, if you win the lottery, I'm going to knock on your door that night. <laughs> and I'm expecting a check. And if you don't think you can afford it, then get a new life. But listen to me. This lottery thing shows where America is. They interviewed some people. Oh, this was last Wednesday. They interviewed some people on Wednesday on Fox, and this is what the people said. Well, I'd buy a new car. Would you go back to work the next day? No way. If you think that money for you is going to totally change your life and you don't want to help anybody else, you're in a sorry state and you have no peace. And even that money won't really bring true peace. True peace, abundant peace, is meekness and generosity. But, but isn't it true? It's really when you start thinking of others that real peace comes. It isn't just thinking of your problems and what would set your life free. Real peace comes by having helped someone else. Reach your hand out instead of reaching your hands in. You know, so many people today say, I need a hug. Well, don't you have two arms? Come on, church. Are you out there? Maybe I'm wrong, but how many of you know you wouldn't need a hug unless you're being self-absorbed? Come on, church. I mean, it's time to hug somebody else. It's time to lift someone else up. It's time to encourage someone else. Because in that action lies my peace. And it doesn't just lie there. It's abundance of peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. More than enough. Don't you like to hang around people that have peace? Do you know why? Because there's more than enough and it might rub off on us. Come on, church. I mean, that's really what life's all about. Life isn't about self. And in America, if, if, if we could preach anything to America with a self-absorbed world, we need to preach that helping somebody else is the real blessing. And I know America doesn't, maybe this sounds sad and maybe you're an animal lover. And look, I grew up around animals. When I was in the third grade, we were living in a mobile home and it had a skirt around it, but there was a little crack and Lady, our dog, little Cocker Spaniel, well, really it was kind of a set, Heinz 57 or 7, whatever we called her. You know, she had a little bit of everything in her. Well, she was pregnant, and of course at night, she got outside, and she wanted to have her pups. And so she got under that little skirt and went to the farthest part of that 56 mobile home, foot long mobile home, 10 foot wide and had her pups 
and my dad was too large to go under the motor home so I was in the third grade well guess who got to crawl all the way back there and I crawled all the way back there true story and dragging a little box with me and I'm glad because at first I wasn't sure lady was gonna let me pick him up how many of no mothers can be pretty intense come on church and so I got back there and I petted her for a minute and then I started putting these little puppies there was eight of them I will never forget in this little box dragging them all around and as much as I love animals well I've raised different animals I remember dragging a possum one time off the road going to see pastor Sandy and I, I was dragging it off the road by the tail and somebody had ran over it and all of a sudden I thought it was moving and it wasn't moving it two little babies crawled out of its sack up on its body and that's what was moving they had their eyes closed and so I got it off the road opened it up and there was two a little more in there there was four all together and I remember going into pastor Sandy's house and I, ra I gave two away to friends of mine that they wanted and sadly enough they died the two I had I hand fed them with a little eyedropper thing and until they grew in and they were about nine months later my mother said you've got to get rid of those animals they're biting everybody and if you've ever seen a possum's face I want to tell you they have a face only a mother can love and a blind mother at that hallelujah but <laughs> Lord how'd I go down this road? I'm sorry I hope you guys don't mind I'm just being honest up here but these are the things I love animals but it tells me where America is I'm watching football yesterday and three times this giving to cruelty for animals but yet we kill a million babies a year I mean what's wrong something's clicked in America the animal industry is billions of dollars now and yet we think nothing about life and the beginning of life it's I really mean this from my heart hear my heart I think it's because some of us have lost a little of our mercy the enemy has hardened us from certain things if you're gonna have peace you better have mercy for people the lost and the hurting it's imperative that we do that amen and then how many of you know we walk in peace when we renew our mind just look at your neighbor and say your problem is sitting on the top of your neck just tell him that hallelujah <laughs> yeah <laughs> some of you really get it talking in there hallelujah but how many of you know the word says that we got to guard our mind and heart but how many of you know it's up to us to renew our mind this is what the word says you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee or you because he trusts you what is that stayed in God that perfect peace if we can have trust through peace then that means if we don't have peace there's probably mistrust there hello I mean if you don't walk in that kind of peace what happens is you begin to suspect everybody Robert did such a great job yesterday at our men's breakfast when he talked about being aware of your surroundings being a good witness as far as what I mean by recognizing when something's wrong and being able to identify what's wrong not witnessing to people about Christ but the biggest problem with most of law enforcement today is even if there's an eyewitness or three eyewitnesses how many of you know every one of them give a different story they don't really look at the person they don't really say well they have a beard they have blonde hair they have blue eyes they're wearing a dark coat I mean seriously if I ask you after you leave this room you've watched me now for 30 minutes for you to describe me to Robert in the foyer I guarantee you I would get different descriptions and I don't know if you don't say he's good-looking <laughs> you're in real trouble but really my point is this listen to me your mind will run wild because you're not witnessing or paying attention to the importance of God and his trust 
that you need to have in him. And when that happens, peace won't be there. It can't. And so that means if that peace isn't there and there isn't trust there, what is there? Distrust. We don't want to fear, though we want to be aware of our surroundings. We want to be a good witness for the police. We want to do these things and we want to see if something's going on that we're aware of it and we can let someone know. But how many of you know we don't want to walk in fear? We still want the spirit to move. We don't want everybody being a police officer when they walk in the door. And Robert did such a great job at sharing that yesterday at our men's breakfast. And I just thank the Lord for that because I think that trust is one of the things also that's lacking in America. Most of us have been abused or someone's done something wrong or someone, we gave them money and they didn't give it back or, or we, they said they would never tell the story and they told the story. How many of you know trust is so easily broken? And just look at your neighbor and say, I'm human. Because it's happened to all of us. We've all probably done something we shouldn't have like that. Even in a good way or meaning it right. But how many of you know the prayer chain is not a gossip chain? Well, we only need to pray about it. I'm telling you this so you can pray about it. Yeah, right. I'm not saying that that is important, but we got to make sure our heart stays right. Why? Because if we don't, it begins to break down trust. And where there isn't trust, there isn't peace. Because what produ the per the production of peace, according to this scripture, read it again, you will keep him in perfect peace. Now listen to me. The word perfect here literally is like this. I will keep him in mature peace. Grown up. Because where you see the word perfect, it doesn't mean total perfection. It means maturity. How many of you know there is a mature peace and there is a weak peace or an immature peace where peace can only be there and trust can only be there when everything's good? But mature peace says, okay, I've been hurt, but I'm still going to trust God. I'm still going to love people. I'm still going to put myself out there, even though I get wounded. I'm big enough. I can deal with this. 